All right, welcome back. Just a quick reminder, this is Test Dive and our special tool Discord is open for all questions and you can ask your questions directed to uh, our speakers during the presentation and right after as well. And with this, I'd like to move on to our next speaker who is Vincent Sinclair and he's going to be talking about software robustness testing. Now, Vincent is a member of the Software Reliability Group within Nokia Bell Labs in Dublin, Ireland. He's responsible for mentoring product development and test teams to improve the robustness of the software systems and solutions by Nokia. He has 30 years experience working around the globe, driving improvements in the reliability and quality of complex software systems. Vincent holds a Master of Science degree in quality with a thesis on software quality and also degrees in computer science, electronic engineering and mathematics. Now, not many people know this, but his first professional computer had 16K of magnetic memory and programming was through paper, tape and teletype. Well, that was then and this is now. Vincent, over to you. Good to have you. Very good. Thank you, Rafael. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, folks on the call. So <clears throat> let's have a look at our talk for today on software robustness testing. What we're going to look at is telecommunications networks and reliability. Then we'll have a look at particularly software robustness defects in telecommunications. And then leading on from that, we'll look at robustness testing. How do you build robustness test cases? With, and we'll give many detailed examples of test cases. And then we'll look at the different software robustness testing techniques. So what I would like you to walk away from this session is a good understanding of what is robustness, how you can test for software robustness using the different techniques, and lots of examples of software robustness test cases to give you some ideas to get started. So let's start with telecommunications networks and reliability. <clears throat> so we're working in Nokia Bell Labs, and of course what we have in terms of telecommunications networks is mobile networks, we have uh, fixed networks, we have IP and optical networks, everything from local optical networks to submarine cables. And then sitting on top of that, we have the Nokia software, the management systems, the billing systems, the subscriber management systems. So very, very complex uh, telecommunications networks. And within this network, what is the, the, the demand for services and different types of services has changed over time. So where are we today? <clears throat> if we look when we started with um, the original communications, which was telegraph, and then we had telephone. But after telephone, we started to move into things like um, video calls, text communications, but it was all around communications. Then we move into an area where we start to use communications for things like banking, for uh, reserving airline tickets, for e-health, much more important for security. So the importance of reliability in the network, in the telecommunications network became higher and higher. And as we move forward, we'll see things like remote sur surgery, um, immersive holodecks, and indeed also driverless cars. So these are all examples of areas where we absolutely need 100% reliability. It, we cannot fail if you're, if you're controlling a car with software through telecommunications, you cannot afford to fail. So this is the level of reliability that we need to reach to. Now, what do I mean by robustness? <clears throat> How do we build robust software systems? Well, the definition of robustness is the degree to which a system or component can function correctly in the presence of invalid inputs or stressful environmental conditions. So two main areas either invalid inputs or stressful environmental conditions. And we'll give lots of examples of those throughout the talk. <clears throat> now, if we're going to build robust software, how should it function 
when we have these invalid inputs or stressful scenarios? Well, the first thing is we need to detect when something goes wrong. If we have an error, we need to make sure we know there's been an error. In telecommunications, if we do not detect an error, we, the result is a sleeping cell, or we have a lack of a connection to a network element, or we're sending data to an invalid IP address. So these are the sort of things that go wrong if you don't detect the problem. The second thing that a robust software should do is to isolate the problem to minimize the impact. Again, ex practical examples from telecommunications, if you don't isolate the problem, you can do an O&M operation like a backup and crash the live traffic, or you can switch over to a redundant network element and impact the operations and live traffic, or you make a configuration error which causes a reset of the base station. So this is where you fail to isolate the problem. And the third thing we should do is recover gracefully. Now, if we reset a mobile network space station, you lose all the traffic. This is for sure not graceful. If you crash the software, you lose all of the tra live traffic. This is for sure not graceful. So our objective is to test the software. So when we have invalid inputs or stressful conditions, we can see that the software detects the problem, isolates it, and recovers gracefully. Let's have a look at each of these in turn. <clears throat> Invalid inputs. And think about your own systems. Think about your own products, your own software solutions, and think about what could be the invalid inputs. For sure, in telecommunications, the invalid inputs could be a value which is outside specification. So it's outside the range. So if the value is supposed to be between 1 and 10, if you put in 20 or 100 or minus 10, it's outside the range. <clears throat> is it in the right format? Is it IPv4 versus IPv6? Do we have a corrupted input or a duplicate input? These are all examples of real world errors in our telecommunications networks that have caused failures. The software must defend itself against these invalid inputs, which is it should detect the invalid input, isolate the invalid input, and then recover gracefully. So that's one half of <clears throat> robustness, invalid inputs. The second half is having the system function correctly in stressful environments. Now, what do we mean by stressful environments? Typically in hardware, if you want to put a component under stress, you will do something like shock testing or vibration or increase the temperature. It's a realistic scenario outside of normal operations. Well, for software, it's exactly the same. A stress scenario is a real world normal operation that, that can happen. It should not happen to, if things are correct, but it actually does happen and we have to deal with it. And there are two types of stress scenarios. Binary, which means it exists or it does not exist. For example, an interface disconnects unexpectedly in the middle of traffic. So that's one stress. The second stress is variable, where the stress has degrees. So this could be the length of the packet delay, the percentage of packet loss, the size of the message storm, or low received power between your handset and the base station. So these are examples of stress scenarios. So looking at <clears throat> the idea of uh, telecommunications and what are the typical areas where we see uh, robustness issues. You can have normal op operations like attaching a phone, setting up a call, having a data session process. You could have download and installation. You could uh, be reconfiguring the system. You could be doing OEM operations. These are typical normal scenarios in telecommunications and the typical triggers for robustness issues are say a missing file, an invalid input, an invalid parameter, um, a corrupted input. And the consequence of these um, invalid inputs is we drop the live traffic, you end up with a sleeping cell or the K KPI degradation. So you have lower speed on the network than you should, or a feature fails, or you have an alarm error. Similarly on the stress scenarios, 
<clears throat> you can have the normal operations <clears throat> such as snapshotting or doing logs and traces. The trigger could be a message flood or a synchronization timing error. And again, you end up with things like dropping the live traffic or KPI degradation or alarm errors. So our objective is to test the software in, with these scenarios, using these inputs, and make sure the software behaves correctly and it detects the problem, it isolates it, and it recovers without affecting the live traffic. Now, where do these problems come from? Where do these robustness defects come from? They can be caused by requirements missing or requirements errors. They can be caused by architecture hotspots, so the CPU is under overload or we're running out of memory, we have resource exhaustion. Or it could be design errors where requirements are misunderstood or feature interactions or coding logic errors. So the, the source or origin of the defects can be in requirements, architecture and design or in coding. And our testing needs to find these defects. So that's the challenge for us as testers. How do we find these robustness defects before they escape to customers? So that's where software robustness testing comes in. What is the role of a software robustness tester? It really is to test the software with invalid data, missing messages, migration fails, procedural errors. It's a different way of thinking. Many times we are most of the time we think about how does the software behave correctly? The, the robustness tester needs to think about what can go wrong? What are the critical failures that can realistically occur? And this is really important to focus on realistic scenarios, not crazy scenarios that would never happen. What are the realistic scenarios? How can the tester stress or break the software to trigger those failures? And how can they test to make sure the software detects the problem, isolates the problem, and recovers gracefully? So that's the role of the robustness tester, how to really attack and break the software. If we want to try and break the software and see how it fails, we may need to test within a layer. So we may need to test just within the application or within the platform or even down at the lower layer of the hardware and the operating system. But we may also need to test across the layers. So a, an error, for example, in the platform may show up as a, a failure at the application. So we really need to test within the software layers and between the software layers. Now the layers may be developed in separate organizations, so there, there's the potential for miscommunications and misunderstanding of the interfaces. Some of our components come from external software suppliers, so again we have the opportunity for errors on the interfaces. And a failure in one layer may need to be detected and recovered from a different layer, so for example an error in the application may need to be recovered by a reset in the software platform. So we need to look at the architecture of the software system and the structure to see how can we test. In Nokia, it is, we used to have one team who was responsible for robustness testing. Now, every team is responsible for robustness testing. So in terms of testing within the layers and across the different layers, we have the feature teams who now have to do a minimum number of robustness test cases for every feature. We have the component and feature interface testing. So this is testing the interfaces between those components with invalid inputs or message errors or timing errors. We have a team who are working on the robustness testing of the installation and the data migration and upgrade because this is a very complex area for us. Certainly at the system level, we do a lot of robustness testing with invalid inputs and stressing the system. Similarly, at the cluster level, where you have multiple nodes and geo-redundancy, we test all of those interfaces, all of those messages. We test the heartbeats, the network congestion, try to stress the system and see where it fails. And lastly, but not least, we test the user documentation. Are the procedures clear, easy to follow, 
and what could potentially go wrong when you're following a documented procedure. So we would robustness test at every phase. It's not just up to one team. Every test team should be doing robustness testing. And looking at that in more detail, at the unit test, we will test with invalid inputs to functions, boundary tests, missing data, missing files. At a component level, we will try to stress the component, check for boundary tests, check for a CPU and memory overload. At the feature level, we're looking very much at the features, the interactions between different features, and making sure what happens if we have invalid inputs or messages that they are managed correctly, detect, isolate, and recover. And certainly at the system test level, then we're looking for things like the feature interactions, the software upgrades, and indeed also the user interface and the usability. Is it clear and easy to use? How could things go wrong? And lastly, at the network level, we're looking at the failures between different nodes and the heartbeats and the timers. So every team, as you can see here, is doing robust, is doing some element of robustness testing. So how do we begin to build a robustness test plan? This is, the, this is what I want to, really one of the takeaways for today. How do you build, how do you know what test cases to execute in terms of robustness? What we do in uh, Nokia is we do a first an analysis of previous outages, previous customer defects. We also look at the customer scenarios and configurations and we identify what are the things that could likely go wrong and what has already gone wrong in the past. So this is one important input to test planning. The second input to the test planning is what are the robustness requirements for this specific release? So it may be robustness about specific features or specific functions. The third input is the system architecture. What are the hotspots, the weak points, the critical interfaces? What are the single points of failure? If we have an architecture change, either at the software level or indeed also at the hardware level, then we do analysis to say, what could potentially go wrong? Where are the stress points? And the last of these four inputs is, what are the new features, the complex areas or new interfaces for this release? They're the high risk areas. We end up then with a list of each of what are the, the main robustness areas where we want to actually focus on for a specific release. So this is our starting point for building a robustness test plan for a specific release. So let's look at each of these in detail. For you, if you're going to start to build a robustness test plan for your own software or your component or subsystem or your product, where do you start? Well, the first thing to do is talk to the system engineers, analyze the interactions between your product and other elements of the network and determine what could go wrong in terms of invalid inputs or stress scenarios on the interfaces. Analyze the previous customer issues. That will really tell you where things can go wrong and develop requirements to prevent these failures. That means you put in the requirements document a method to gracefully detect, isolate, and recover from these failures. That's one input. The second input is talk to the architects. Analyze the architecture to see what are the potential robustness faults in terms of hotspots, weak points, single points of failure. Again, make a list of the high risk components and features and focus your testing there. And the third thing is talk to the designers and coders and make sure that they are trained and knowledgeable in defensive programming and error checking. So even at the very low level of units of code, we should be look, thinking about the rainy day cases uh, and for the development and designers thinking about what could go wrong and how do we handle those where you have arguments which are out of range or null pointers or memory allocation errors. So that is step one to plan your robustness test. Step two, do the analysis of the customer defects. The questions you can ask are, which software components or subsystems are most prone to fault? 
which software or failure mechanisms are most common? Is it timing issues? Is it latency issues? Is it heartbeat failures? Is it invalid, invalid input data or invalid messages? This will tell you, uh, give you a really good idea how you, what sort of robustness tests you should be doing. So the tester should ask, what has already gone wrong? What other similar things could go wrong? And how can I, as a tester, trigger such errors for a test? So let's look at some examples. And these are real world failures within customers' networks. So you can see from these defects, you get some ideas of how to test. Lost connections, this controller lockup, a mated pair switch over, overflow due to resource usage, IP instability, latency in the connections, packet loss. So these are good examples of the sort of test cases, software robustness test cases that you could apply in your test plan. And these are had the links between what really happens in the field which are which your software and robustness testing. The second thing is look at the system requirements. What are the inputs and outputs? What are the known robustness requirements, the failure modes? What could go wrong? We need to have requirements to properly manage these failure modes and these error cases and corner cases. So if a particular case happens, the software should detect that, it should isolate and recover. And let me give you a good example of how this, when this does not happen or when this goes wrong. So the example is an edge card router. It had 16 cards. One card failed. When it failed, it switched over to the second card, but the second card was now in overload, so it failed. It switched over to the third card, and one after another, every single card went into overload, and every single card failed. There should have been a requirement that when the card fails, it does not shift the load to the second card, if it's going to cause overload. So this is where you need to have in the requirements, how do you manage and take care when you have network failures or timing issues or data floods or overloads? So that's the second thing to do. Talking to the system engineers, ask your system engineers, what are the hotspot components? Which components are, which software components are under stress working maybe at the limit of their capacity. What are the single points of failure? You know, that's the idea with the architecture is to, to, to do fault modeling and think about what could fail. So here we can see um, within Nokia, these are examples of the things that could fail, either the hardware or the software or the high availability platform or indeed also procedural failures. So we think about what are the things could go, go wrong that would cause memory exhaustion? What happens if a process or a thread fails? What happens if we have an overload condition? So this is where the architects and the developers and the testers need to sit together to analyze what could go wrong. And lastly, the high risk areas. And for us, what we find is typically high risk areas are where we have brand new features, new or new components or new interfaces. For example, we recently introduced an interface, a new interface on our OEM system. So we did a lot of robustness testing of that because it was a completely new interface. So this is the, the, how you build up the list of things that you want to do in terms of actually doing robustness testing. So actually do these tests. Once you have your list of areas where you want to focus your testing from the analysis of the customer defects and the architecture analysis, you have to decide what is the best way to test it. And there are three possible ways. You can do fault injection, which is inputting invalid inputs at the interfaces, either the external or internal interfaces, or putting the system under stress through CPU overload or message storms or memory exhaustion. So that is the first of the three techniques. The second of the three techniques is exploratory testing. And this is where a tester explores the software step by step. Essentially, they try to see 
what could go wrong at each step, and they try to break the software. And the third technique we use in Nokia is bug hunting. And bug hunting is typically a dedicated session of one to two days where we have a kickoff, we set up the testing environment, we set up the uh, scenarios that we want to test. We typically have three to six bug hunting teams. And the objective is to find defects. Essentially, we ask the developer, te the testers and developers and architects to break the software. Do what you want. Do anything you want and try and break the software and find robustness defects. This is actually good fun. The teams love doing it. But more importantly, it really is an excellent way of finding robustness defects. We find a lot of robustness defects doing this. And also we find a lot of defects which are very similar as the, the defects which have in the past been escaping to customers. So it's a very good technique to find defects which used to escape to customers. Let's look at each of these three in more detail. If I look at fault injection, okay, so this is where you want to input a, an error. So you can explore the input domain. So for example, you can apply an input that should force an error message and check, does the error message occur? If the error message occurs, then you know it detected the issue and it isolated it and you can recover from it. Apply the wrong inputs or uh, put in um, characters which are not allowed or outside of the parameters. If the parameter value is supposed to be between zero and 50, put in a value of 100 or 200 or minus 20 or put in A, B, C, D. You can also explore the stored data. What happens if data that you need is corrupted? How does the system behave? Does it behave gracefully? You can explore the computation side of it and the feature interaction. What happens if you have an in invalid operand? What happens if you have data uh, features that share data and they interact incorrectly? So these are lots of examples of how you can um, test the software for robustness. For example, on the interface, you can fill a file system to its capacity. And again, these are all examples of outages we've had with our customers caused by these errors. You can have an invalid file name during an upgrade operation. You can have a file which is not accessible because it's locked. You can generate out of order messages. You can, uh, for example, you can change the contents of a file that the program is reading and it crashed. You can change the packet or link rate. All of these are things, ways of testing the software to see how does it behave. And cancel um, functions. You can cancel tasks. You can lock the system and see does it behave correctly. For example, you can lock a radio unit and it should not react to when you tell it to shut down. And with us, we have had examples where you lock a unit, it should be secure, you tell it to shut down and it shuts down. So these are examples of robustness testing. So this here are good examples of the fault injection. And also you can do things like swap out the memory, compete for processor access, these are all good examples of fault injection. The second technique is exploratory testing. <clears throat> exploratory testing is described as goal-oriented wandering. There is a goal described in the test charter. So exploratory testing is usually based on an exploratory testing charter. An example of a test charter is test as many scenarios as possible, leading to the license mismatch alarm. So this is what you want to check. You want to check during the license mismatch, does it detect the error, does it raise the alarm, and does it recover gracefully? So you have a defined starting point <clears throat> to test the license mismatch, but then the tester can do anything they want. They decide, they analyze, they decide what it is is the next step in the test procedure. It's typically time limited to between one and two hours. It's done at unit and component test. If it's done at solution level, it can take a little bit longer, but it's typically done by an experienced tester and it is very effective in finding software robustness defects. 
The third technique, so if we look at the software robustness testing, the test steps in it are a test charter, a test session, typically one to two hours. Oops, it's time boxed. And we also automatically log the results of the session. So we keep notes of the uh, steps that are executed during the um, testing. And then when it's when the exploratory testing is finished, we keep a record of the potential bugs, and those potential bugs are discussed with a test manager to agree is the scenario realistic, and if it's realistic, then it's raised as a bug. So here's an example of an exploratory testing session. Here we're going to test hot removing and inserting a radio unit. So what we want to test is recovery scenario after we insert or remove a radio unit in a live network. How can it be tested? Well, you can do several attempts of optical cable removal, which connects and disconnects the system. You could add some attenuators in to the optical cable to see how the system behaves. You could remove the connector and insert it back in. You can change the optical cable length to see does that affect how does the software behave correctly. You can do the hot remove insert multiple times in the row, does it still behave correctly? You can connect a, sef a second optical connector at the RF module, or change the optical port on the RF module and see how it behaves. And what we tell the tester is, what you're looking for is, any abnormal behavior of the radio modules or the base station. Do we have any unexpected alarms? Do any of the software components crash? Does the radio unit get detected and put on air when we insert it, because that's how it should behave correctly. When you insert it, it should be detected, configured, and then made available for live traffic. So this is a good example of exploratory testing. And the third one is <clears throat> bug hunting. Here we have a bug hunting session. Uh, this is dedicated time where small teams of testers and developers try to find bugs, especially robustness bugs, by attacking the software. So this is really trying to break the software. And it is good fun. And the bug hunting team is typically an ad hoc testing team coming together for this one session. For the, se the bug hunting session, which is typically one day, each team will have a specific focus area to try to break, okay? They don't have the test cases, they're just told we want you to test this specific area, and they focus on that area. It's also very much testing the software from a customer's point of view, and we do typically one bug hunting session per team, per quarter, per or per release. We run it as a competition. Uh, we have prizes for the most critical def defect found, uh, the defect with the largest impact, either end user impact or impact on our network operator are the defect which is most likely to happen in the field because those are the ones that will cause the most pain for customers. We also give prizes for the craziest defect and sometimes we find some very bizarre defects which will crash the software. And as said, we run it as a competition, but also it, the testers really enjoy this. It's good fun. And also because we bring together architects, developers and testers within this bug hunting session, they actually learn a huge amount from each other. So it's great for cross-team learning between architecture and design and coding and testers. We typically run the session as three to six bug hunting teams in the same room. Uh, each bug hunting team is between two and four people. And typically each team has a tester, a developer, and an architect, and maybe a subject matter expert. We have also started since COVID running remote bug hunting sessions, um, and these are typically three to four hours uh, with smaller number of teams because it, it's harder to coordinate when you're doing it uh, on uh, MS Teams or by WebEx. But these are working very well. And again, they're very effective in finding um, customer type defects. And this is one of the interesting things with bug hunting you can really find a lot of customer-like defects. So the, the output of this is you find critical defects that are currently escaping the customers. You focus testing on the critical areas of the pain points. So you really strengthen your software. 
you test the software from a customer's point of view and it really complements the normal functional testing. It also improves the skills and knowledge of developers and testers. It improves the developer's understanding of how the software can be used by customers and how it can go wrong. It increases the tester's skill and knowledge. It improves the tester's understanding of how the software works because they can ask specific questions to architects and developers. And it really builds the team's effectiveness by connecting testers, developers, and architects together. It really helps to break down these barriers, especially if you have teams distributed across America and Europe and Asia Pacific. So the last thing to touch on is procedural robustness, because I don't want to forget this, because we think about the software all the time, but we also need to think about the procedural the OEM operation and maintenance operations, the configuration activities, the installation and upgrade activities. We also need to make sure that we robustness test these activities um, as part of the robustness program. So not just the software, but we need to robustness test the procedures. Does the software manage invalid inputs or stressful environments caused by incorrect procedures or errors when executing the procedures? Does the software alert the user when they want to shut down a node with live traffic? And again, I will give a good example. We had an outage uh, recently in Europe where we had a load balanced system with two nodes. We wanted to upgrade the, the, node, the software. We shifted all of the traffic from node A to node B. The objective was to upgrade, upgrade node A, but by error, the operator shut down node B with all of the light traffic. And from a robustness point of view, it the, when the operator asked node B to shut down with all of the live traffic, from my point of view, the node should have detected that error and said, do you really want to shut down this node? There are 600,000 live calls. Unfortunately, we didn't have that built into the software, so it shut down 600,000 live calls. So don't forget the procedural error. So in conclusion, what can I say? For you to build your own software robustness test plan, start with the analysis of the customer complaints, the outage data, the customer tickets, the customer scenarios and configurations. Think about what could go wrong the architectural hotspots and weak points, the high-risk areas. From that, uh, are fault injection, which are exploratory testing and which would be best for bug hunting. And then build your test cases and your exploratory testing sessions and your bug hunting sessions and go and see if you can find these software robustness bugs before they escape to customers. So Rafael, let me stop there and open it up to the good team for our questions or comments. Thank you so much, Vincent. So this has been Vincent Sinclair talking about software robustness testing. And indeed, we do have a question from the audience, uh, if you don't mind answering, Vincent. And the question is, is human error or end users error leading to outage normally part of robustness testing? In other words, should we anticipate customers' faults? Absolutely. Um, and let me say from a telecommunications point of view, we have customers who range from an AT&T or a China Unicom or a Deutsche Telekom who are very knowledgeable and very experienced to many other smaller customers who have a lot less knowledge and expertise and they make a lot of errors. So let me give you a few examples. Please, yes. One concrete example is the one I just gave, which was in Europe, where we had two nodes and the customer made an error shutting down a node with live traffic. A second error was um, in South America, where a customer reconfigured their text messaging system and the text messages went were directed to a node which was offline. And literally 50% of the country's text messages for a period of three hours went into a black hole and disappeared. And there was a lot of text messages caused by the, the, the customer making a mistake. A third error we had was a customer reconfigured a billing system. 
And what happened is the, the billing system, the billing record should have been stored on a hard disk, moved to a central system, and then removed from the local hard disk. They changed the configuration so it did not remove the local record. The hard disk filled up, and in this case, in Mexico, the, uh, the, the operator ended up having to give away free calls and sessions for 18 hours for basically a population of 8 million people. So they lost all of that finance because the, the, the user. We also see a lot of issues with configuration, particularly as we move into the cloudification of the network with CUs and DUs and centralized units and cloud units. The configurations become are becoming more and more complex and the opportunity for error is really increasing exponentially. The other thing I would say to answer that question is the consequence of an error is huge. So my wife works in the medical field and where they are gathering data from the telecommunications network regarding people's pacemakers. If you have a failure there caused by a doctor making an error, then the consequences are huge. Or if you have a driverless car. So yes, you absolutely. And as we move into the internet of things, there are going to be more connected devices. I yes, hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, excellent examples. Thank you very much for that. And one more, if that's okay with you. Do you have some kind of test plan, like topics which should be checked for bug hunting things? Yes. So um, we in so the way that we do it in for the bug hunting is we it's the it's the same approach. You look at the the four inputs. So if let me give some practical examples here. So if I look at um, if I look at the four inputs, we analyze. The, the, the inputs f from our customers and for we sort of say what are the what are the issues we've had in the, with the previous releases for what are the new features in this release what are the architectural hotspots for example we have one part of our system which is currently changing from FPGA to ARM so that's a big architectural change so we'll do an analysis of that then when we have the list of what we think are the robustness issues for this release we say these ones are fault injection these ones we can do in exploratory and these ones we want to do in bug hunting. And then we give a charter to the bug hunting teams saying we want to look at you to look at, you know, configuration of the, of the CU or reconfiguration of the radio unit or interaction of the 4G and 5G uh, interface interworking when you transfer a call from 4G to 5G. And then we say you're the experts. See how you can break the system. Okay, very much, very uh, useful. Uh, and one more question. At what phase of software production robustness tests are performed at the end of the release or maybe sooner? You were breaking up there. So I, I think the question is, uh, where do you perform robustness testing, is it? At what phase, when? Yeah, at what phase, that's right. Every phase. So can I please encourage everybody in this call, do not give it to one team and say, you guys own robustness testing. We have robustness testing done at unit level. So at the unit level, the developer is responsible to do testing of invalid inputs. You know, what happens if I put in a parameter out of range or it's missing data or it's missing a file that the particular little piece of code needs. Similarly, at a component level, we do a lot of feature interaction testing. So every level has got to do the, and in fact, that's the way we structure it. We say, here's the testing that needs to be done. Some of this is that can only be done at system level. Some can be done at subsystem level. Some can be done at feature level, and some can be done at unit level. Okay, and thank it, you. Yeah, it, pays, it really is. It is amazing when you get the developers to think about what can go wrong, how it improves the design. And there's one more question, if you don't mind. I think it's a sort of follow up. How about having a test plan before actual development starts? Yeah, so the, this is this is the within this is part of the, the 
parallel processing. So when we are building a new release, so you know 21A or 21B, um, we will be building the development, but we're also building the test plan. And the, the, the advantage of this is the testers have a very different way of thinking. They think about from the users and customers' point of view, and they also think about what couldn't go wrong. Whereas the developers are thinking, how do I make this thing work? How do I make it do what it's supposed to do? The developers are thinking about what can go wrong, and that then feeds into the DFMEA session. So we have, for each feature, we have a failure mode and effects analysis session, which brings in the testers and developers when they're planning the feature. And by the way, in Nokia, it's now mandatory that every feature has a minimum of a certain number of robustness test cases. Wonderful. Vincent, thank you so much for sharing your vast knowledge about software robustness testing. Vincent Sinclair there, who's normally based in Dublin, Ireland. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time and thank you for your expertise.